Hi, Nick. Welcome to the Integrative Health Coaching Success Podcast. How are you today? Great. Thank you so much for having me. Stoked to be here. Yeah, we're excited to have you. I can't wait for the listeners to get your intake on some niche uh, markets here in the in the health coaching field, and also about your book, which we're going to dive into a little later on in the episode. Uh, what I'd love to do to start is, can you share with everybody kind of where you began in your health coaching, health minded journey? Uh, we can kind of start at the beginning, and you can tell people how you got motivated to get started in this field, and then kind of take us to present day. Yeah, of course. Um, so my story, we'll throw it way back, kind of starts at um, age four when I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. So living with a chronic illness since I was really young kind of helped me to really be in touch with my body and you know what I eat and how I felt, You know, made me really body aware. Um, and that led me, as, um, as I got into high school and college, really be interested in athletics and movement and you know biomechanics. So I kind of fell into the world of exercise science in college. Um, so I just graduated in 2020 with my um, bachelor's in exercise physiology. So uh, I'm now an exercise physiologist, um, integrative health practitioner, obviously, and super interested in um, manual therapy. So you know the world of massage and touch therapy, I think that's kind of the next avenue that I'll head into. Um, but yeah, so throughout that whole life with the chronic illness, um, I was sort of, um, you know, a very go, go, go type a personality. Like I like to do a lot of things, read a lot of books, learn everything. And partway through college, I kind of started getting hit with these, um, chronic stress type symptoms, I guess. Um, and then as I graduated college, it's when it all really hit me and I was really forced to slow everything down so that go, go, go personality, you know, that was a big obstacle that hit me and I had to slow things down and, um, I had to completely overhaul my whole life. So through changing my lifestyle, through supplements, through reducing stress, um, a lot of deep emotional work, I've gone through this huge healing journey myself and I'm super excited to be able to, uh, help other people do the same. That's wonderful. So it's interesting that you kind of touch upon an obstacle kind of in that realm. If we kind of go back so that the obstacle that was most apparent at that point was you were super interested in helping people, you know, feel, get well, feel good in their body, but you were noticing that that wasn't happening for you. And so many people, I think, ignore that signal for so long, right? And they just like keep that barrel, rain barrel keeps overflowing for years and years. And you were able to kind of recognize it um, quicker and be able to, to take hold of it. What has that kind of allowed you to bring into your practice, you know, with, with working with clients? Yeah, I think, I think it is so, so valuable just to, just to have the experience yourself and be able to really be empathetic with the clients that you're working with. And I see the same thing. I work with a lot of people that have type one diabetes. So, you know, a lot of teenagers, a lot of younger kids and families that are also battling type one. And just to see the look on people's face when you're, you know, you're injecting insulin yourself and you have, you know, you're wearing the same glucose monitor that this young kid is just to see the look on their face that, wow, he's been through it too. And he's lived it is so, so powerful rather than just, you know, a doctor who has been taught to teach it. It's like experience-based learning rather than just, you know, being taught to teach it. Of course. Yes. And it all goes back to that simple human need that I think so many of us have, which is that need of belonging and relatability and just knowing that someone else feels what you feel and that there's someone else that can understand what you're going through, right? Because we all crave that that relationship uh, somehow. So that's, yeah, something so important. So tell us a little bit, because I think being a male, right, we are our second male guest here on the show. I'd like for you to share with the listeners, what your kind of vision for men in this health coaching and more health minded space is, why do you feel like it's so important? What's kind of your vision for it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I feel like, you know, I came from this sort of, I guess you could call it more meathead world of personal training and Olympic weightlifting and powerlifting, which is all, it's not always, but a lot of times it's very ego driven. Like you must get strong, you must get bigger. And, you know, that was me when I was in college, like I was there, I was doing the Olympic lifting, the power lifting. And it's part of the reason why my body was so burnt out. You know, my adrenals were shot. I was running on stress hormones and because of the health issues that really forced me to slow down, it, 
it really forced me to take a hard look at why I was doing what I was doing and realize that it wasn't for my health. And again, it was more ego driven. And I feel like too many males that I know that are in the world of health, whether it's personal training or, or whatever, um, they feel like the natural health or the holistic health world, or even the health coaching world is too, too soft or too airy fairy, I guess. Um, you know, they, they don't want to talk about their emotional balance and their stress balancing when in reality, that's what so many males in society really need. Like they need that slow down. So I just, I'm kind of all about helping demystify the idea of natural health and like really diving into your health from every aspect. Yes. Yeah. Because regardless of what your gender is, right, we, our bodies all need some sort of stress and emotional based support balance, whatever you want to call it. And I think our society and our culture, right, has, I mean, done such a disservice to men where you're right. It is like bigger, the stronger you are, the more resilient you are, the more of a man you are. And I always, you know, say men, yes, you know, in in our culture, it's one of those things where they quote unquote, take care of women or like that's been their goal. But uh, how about take care of yourself? Because Mm -hmm. when you're taking care of yourself and you're the best version of yourself, emotionally, physically, spiritually, what have you, you're then the, the best version of yourself and your presence is protective and you know, healthy for everybody around you, whether it's your family or your wife or your kids or your mother. And so ignoring so many of those important aspects of health. And I think that's kind of your point, which is health is way more than just what you're eating and how much you're exercising and how much you can bench press. (laughs) And there's this whole aspect to it that plays a huge role into really how physiologically healthy you are is such an important vision for, you know, you to kind of hold and, and be trying to achieve. Totally. Totally. And it's, it's funny you bring that up because that's kind of, you know, part of my whole philosophy. So my, my coaching, um, my coaching company is called blueprint wellness. And the whole idea is that, you know, essentially we live in this world now that our bodies and our nervous systems weren't really adapted for, like things are so fast moving now with technology and, you know, we wear shoes that destroy our natural movement and we sit all day and we take in toxins from literally everything around us. And we're destroying this perfect human design that we're all born with. You know, we have this innate blueprint of health, hence blueprint wellness. And, you know, we're not made to be sick. We're not made to need all these pharmaceuticals and things. Um, And we're, you know, we're not meant to spend the last 30 years of our life suffering and just sitting around. Like we're meant to live. We're designed for health. And the way we live today, like really, really destroys that blueprint. So that's kind of the basis behind, you know, my whole philosophy. Yes. And, and bringing to light the fact that just because it's common doesn't mean it's normal. Cause I feel like so many people are just like, well, this is how everybody's living around me. You know, Oh, mm-hmm. I'm 60. Now I hear so many people. Well, I am getting older and you know, the whole getting older thing, well, you're getting older, but that doesn't mean you need to stop living. And just because everybody around you seems to be falling apart, doesn't mean that that's normal. Our bodies were designed to you know, do, do all of the things that they want to do well into seventies and eighties, if we're healthy enough. And if our bodies have been taken care of in a way that, that, that you get there and you're still living vital, you know, vitally at that point in your, in your life. So I think a lot of bringing just the fact really, right. That like somebody isn't Zoloft deficient. They don't like, that's not how they got to having emotional based imbalances and finding out what does their body need to get back to a state that they were meant to be in? Yep, exactly. And I've found even the, you know, more, I guess, metaphysical side of things has been so big in my healing journey of just, you know, dropping some of the limiting beliefs that I had grown up with, grown up around, um, was, you know, if not as big as the whole, you know, cleaning up my gut and, and starting to heal my adrenals and my thyroid, like just the the ideas, your mindset is so, so huge. Yes. Yep. And it's, it can almost be what makes or breaks things, breaks things mm-hmm. too, because, you know, having a limiting mindset with all of the best supplements, all of the best plans, your body's going to internalize all of that intervention in a much different way than if you kind of made your mind up that things are going to change and you're going to heal. So the mind I think is, can, can make or break things for sure. Totally. Totally. And that's a world that I'm, um, um, definitely want to lead blueprint wellness into is this kind of this idea of spatial medicine where, you know, I kind of started in the, 
the world of posture and movement. And, you know, there is such, such an amazing um, potential for affecting the more metaphysical side of a person through their movement, through body work, through helping them change their posture. Cause you know, when you, when you see a depressed person walking around, they're usually not standing up nice and tall and excited to see the world. They're usually, you know, sheltered and small and, um, you know, just, you know, every little piece of a person affects the whole. And that's another big part of my philosophy is the whole idea of, you know, uh, I guess duality and like Chinese medicine and yin and yang, like there's no, you know, exact cause and effect. Like we love to think in Western medicine, everything is this big interconnecting web. And I'm all about, you know, helping people rebalance their bodies from the inside. So the mindset, the emotions, the metabolism, but also the outside, the posture, the movement, like, are they in an environment that's okay for healing? Cause that was a big thing for me too. I had to change my my whole outside environment in order to heal on the inside. So it always goes both ways. Yes. Yeah. Such, such great points. I, I'd like you to share some specifics about, so you kind of just dove into it a little bit, but your current practice. So at this point you're doing things like nutrition kind of coaching, health coaching, and the more, um, postural, actual physical type of interventions. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. Exactly. Okay. And do you work, uh, you mentioned kids at the beginning. So I'm curious, uh, do you like working with kids? Is that kind of one of your, you know, niche markets as far as, uh, um, the diabetes is concerned? Definitely. Yeah. I love, love, love working with kids. Um, I've spent a lot of time throughout my college career, uh, volunteering with a lot of different, um, like camps and hospitals for kids with type one. It's one of those things that just brings me joy, like sharing my whole life experience, living with this disease with, the younger generation. Cause I feel like I have so much to share and that's part of why I wrote my book. Um, but yeah, other than that, um, obviously I'm happy to work with anyone, but yeah, I love working with kids and love working with people with type one. Yes. Which I think too, it's so interesting how some people get these diagnoses early on and they kind of define them in this limiting, uh, really negative way. And then I think there's people like you who take you're, it's almost like you're healing whatever part may have been, you know, whatever childhood may have been changed for you. And you're healing it by doing all this amazing work now and using it to your advantage rather than kind of using it as something that could hold you back or limit you or make you bitter about the world. There's typically two ways to go. And usually when you go in the direction you're going in, I mean, it's, it's life changing for those around you and who choose to work with you. Totally. Yeah. And that's obviously like kind of the big overarching theme of my book in general, but I'm, I do the same thing with any of my clients, like just having them look at the positives of every situation. Like for me, part of my whole, you know, chronic stress based issues has been a lot of like OCD symptoms, anxiety symptoms. And I could look at that as a bad thing, or I could say, you know, if it weren't for my OCD and anxiety, I I'm, you know, never would have been as organized and productive as I have been over the last few years. I'm so, so aware of what's happening around me and with the people around me. So like, I probably never would have written my book if I didn't have that part of my brain switched on. And not that it's good to be on all the time and running on stress hormones, but you know, you have to be thankful for, for everything you're given. It's all a learning experience. Of course. Of course. So on that note, let's kind of switch gears to the book, because this is something that we haven't talked with any uh, guests with yet. So nobody that's written a book or kind of walked us through, actually, that's not true. We've had one that's uh, written a book, but what, no one that we kind of walked through the process or that beginning stages of what if there are people listening who are like, gee, you know, I am a writer. I love writing. I have a message that I want to get out to the world. Share with us a little bit about what you went through in the early stages of writing the book. And then of course, share the title and what the book's about and all of that with us. Yeah, of course. Um, so when I first decided to write a book, I think it was it's probably about halfway through my senior year of college. Um, and it's kind of a unique route to take, I guess, because it was so early on in my life. So I started with it sort of as a, um, like an independent study, I guess, with my school. So I worked with one of my advisors to actually get some, some credit instead of taking another class. I said, Hey, I'm going to be writing this book. I might as well see if I can get college credit for it. So, so I worked with him closely and we met every week and we talked about how the process was going as I was writing things. Um, and then after that, um, right after I graduated from school, I worked with a really awesome movement company. They're called original strength. And I'm a coach through them. And they, their whole idea is basically, um, 
you know, you were made to move, you're not made to be broken. And we all have this, again, kind of like a blueprint of health that we're born with. And they're all about developmental movement. So movements like rocking, rolling, crawling, all the basic movements that we're all born with and using those to kind of reset your body back to its original blueprint. So obviously like we share a very similar philosophy. So I've always loved what they're about. So I reached out to them because I know they publish a lot of movement based books and um, said, Hey, I want to get this thing out to the world. Would you guys be interested in helping me? And their CEO emailed me right back. His name's Tim Anderson. Great guy. He said, yes, we would love to. And it was all up from there. So I worked with them. They have a little editing team and their, uh, their art department helped me out. And here we are a year later and I published the book at age 21. So it's pretty awesome. Pretty surreal. Wow. That's amazing. So what is the, what's the main uh, point of the book? What's your, what's the tone of it? Walk us through a little bit about what, what the message is. Yeah. So it's called positively type one, how living with a chronic illness can be your most powerful motivator for an extraordinary life. So it kind of goes back to what we were just talking about, about seeing the positives in every situation and seeing life through a lens of optimism, but specifically relating to diabetes or really any chronic illness. Um, but the inspiration for it kind of started when I was at diabetes camp, the camps that I mentioned, um, you know, being a counselor at over the years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talk about this concept of diabetes burnout, where you kind of get burnt out of dealing with this 24 hour, 365 day a year chronic disease. You're always counting carbs. You're always taking insulin shots and it does get, you know, super tiring. So diabetes burnout is a very real thing. Um, but you know, as we would talk about this topic, I kind of realized that it was something that I never had really experienced. And I did a lot of like, you know, meditating on why, why was this something that I had never experienced? Like everyone else is talking about it. Why, why me? Why not me? Um, and I realized it was really because of this positive optimistic lens that's always kind of guided my life. And so I decided that I really wanted to share that message with other people living with type one so that hopefully it's something that that they can avoid through their whole time living with type one. So basically every chapter of the book is a different um, skill or character trait that living with type one helps you to really master. So, you know, you become an amazing problem solver. Um, you learn how to use humor in, you know, sad or like dark situations. Um, all these amazing skills that you build you become really mature, all these different things. Um, and then after each chapter, I chose one of the kids that I had worked with in the past at either the hospital or at the diabetes camps and have like sort of a little mini interview with them, a little spotlight where they talk about their experience. And I asked them a couple questions about, you know, what, what positive things have you gotten from living with type one? So it's kind of geared towards a younger audience. So rather than just hearing it from me, they're hearing it from their peers too. So I tried to make that, um, you know, I feel like it's a little more powerful when it comes from someone who is your age rather than just someone who who has lived it, but is older than you. It's a little harder to relate. Yes. Yes. Although 21, I would say is, st is still young enough that you probably <laughs> are yeah, relating to a lot of younger, uh, certainly readers, which is amazing. Now I'm curious because you said something interesting where you, um, I forget the words that you use, but you were blessed with, or you were surrounded by just like this positivity. Is that something that you think is just part of who you were, like you were just kind of born that way. You were born somewhat more optimistic than others. Is it something that you worked hard at? Uh, is it something that you were exposed to from family members? Did you have really positive minded parents or what about that? Do you, where do you, where did you get that? Do you think? Yeah, that's a great question that I've never, never really thought too much on, but I think def part of it definitely comes from my family and my parents. Like they were always very adamant about, um, you know, allowing me to do everything that a quote unquote normal kid does without type one, just adapting thing and changing things. You know, I played sports for my whole life. I played lacrosse, basketball. I was at every birthday party eating the birthday cake that everybody else was eating. Um, so yeah, I think that was a big part of it. And just, just like you said, I think I've just always been a very positive, optimistic person ever since I was young. And I think that also just comes with being diagnosed at such an early age to where it's sort of all I know, like it's just a huge part of my life now and I can't see my life without it. Whereas some people who get diagnosed, you know, age eight, age 10, even into adulthood, like you've lived so many years already and you've developed habits and different things. And then you have to totally change things around. And that's where the burnout can really 
can really, really affect you. Yeah. And it, it almost may be that your positivity and lots of your outcomes, you know, also came from, which is the point of the book, your ability to kind of mature a little bit earlier. And you had something that you were responsible for and something that you had to pay attention to. And so that might've been part of it too. For sure. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so as far as the book is concerned, when you kind of started writing it, it seems like you had, would you almost call them mentors, the gentleman that helped you at college and then maybe the, the company that you reached out to, would you suggest that people that are looking to write books, you know, just get started writing, reach out to a mentor first? Is there like a specific step that you feel like is important in the beginning? Yeah. So I would say, I mean, working with a mentor or a coach is always a great idea. I mean, my time, you know, obviously my time in college was great and I learned a lot, but I learned so much more from my apprenticeships and mentorships with, you know, other health professionals. Um, but personally, when I wrote the book itself, it was just more of, I guess, like a passion project where one day I just decided to start writing and I was like, I'm going to do this, you know? <laughs> and, um, and then over that year, it probably took me about a year to write it. Um, I was actually in, uh, I spent like five or six months in Australia doing my internship for school. So it was funny. I had these really, really long flights back and forth. So I spent like 10 hours each way writing the book and then I was in school. So whenever I had any sort of free time, I would just pick up my laptop and write a couple pages and I wasn't stressing myself out about it. Um, but the other big piece of advice I would have is it's so easy to say you want to write a book and then have, you know, have your document up and just spend years and years refining. Cause you know, you're always learning things. You're always growing and you could go back and change things constantly. And I'm the same kind of person who like, I guess I can be a perfectionist where I really want to, you know, do the best at everything. And which is, I think a good mindset to have, but it can also get you into trouble to where I could never have put the book out and just constantly been refining, refining, refining and saying, Oh, it'll be better next year. It'll be better next year. But I'm really thankful that I just decided to put the book out immediately just to have something out there because regardless, I, you know, it's, it's going to help people in some way. And of course it could be better. And I've grown so much in the last year with my whole healing journey since I published the book, you know, yes. but just, just getting something out there and being proud of what you have out there, I think is, is a big thing. It's something that I, it took me a while to learn. Of course. Of course. I think there's a, so some quote about if you, if everybody started when they were ready, nobody would start, you know, and, um, Dr. Gabal has been such an inspiration for me in that way where, you know, he's kind of given me opportunities. I mean, even hosting this podcast, I'm like, I don't think I'm ready to host a podcast. And he's like, no, you'll be ready when you start doing it. <laughs> and <laughs> it's true because we kind of like, don't get to that point where we're fully comfortable, hundred percent comfortable doing something new or putting ourselves out there being vulnerable. I mean, but that's where you grow, right? Mm -hmm. You do, you take one step that feels like it's really important. Or like you said, you released your passion project. It's out there. So now when you do something that you think is quote unquote better, or that's, you know, has good information, then you write another book. And the right. first one doesn't have to be perfect. Neither does the second one. And we're kind of all here to just be refining from the day before and just trying a little bit harder the next day. And nothing ever is perfect, nor does it have to be for it to be good enough. And I think that that's a huge takeaway for especially people that are kind of just starting out in this health coaching realm. Definitely. And I think it also goes back to the whole, you know, living with type one for my whole life, like diabetes treatment is never perfect. And you can, you know, do everything perfect, but then for some unknown reason, you know, it's more humid one day or something so small and minuscule, your blood sugars will be way off. So it's another thing you learn from living with a chronic illness, you know? Yes. And not, not, you know, beating yourself up for the fact that, oh, geez, you know, th the numbers are off. Cause I think when you're a perfectionist or you can kind of look at it and think, great, what did I do wrong yesterday? But you're right. Maybe the wind blew the wrong way. And that's kind of where you know, holding ourselves accountable is important, but also giving ourselves grace around just the simple fact of life is, is important for, for all of our mental uh, well-being. Totally. Totally agree. Yeah. All right. So we've talked a little bit about your book. Um, I'm curious, you've done IHP. So other than like IHP, the rain barrel effect, your book, do you have any favorite educational resources, whether they be business related or health minded related. Uh, and one kind of thing that we haven't touched upon much at all, is kind of the more physiological, you know, 
the um, exercise science background, all of that stuff. So even books on that or, uh, you know, resources for that. What is some of your kind of favorite go-tos as far as educational resources? Yeah, I love this question. Mm -hmm. Um, You know me, I'm super nerdy with all this. So I could, my bookshelf is full all the time. (laughs) Um, But I think my favorite book probably that I recommend to like all my clients, everyone that I work with, um, is called The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. I hope I'm saying that right. I don't know if you've read it, but that is one of my favorites. It's so, you know, it's so well-written. It's so simple, um, but super life-changing, you know, just having those, I won't spoil it or anything. I have a poster in my room with the four agreements on it right now, but just having those four um, concepts to take with you through life is such a, such a valuable thing. So that's my number one. Um, And then number two, I talked a little bit about this idea of spatial medicine and, you know, using movement and body work to affect the physiology. Um, so that, um, my passion for that kind of led me into studying something called structural integration. You might've heard it as rolfing. Um, Oh yes. Yeah. So it's a form of body work. Um, and the whole idea is essentially rebalancing the body. So, you know, it looks like massage, but the, the movements that you're doing are very different. It's kind of like a dance between the client and the practitioner where the client is moving at the same time as you're moving their tissue. And the whole goal is to help them balance their body segments for optimal posture. But we know that if you can get someone to optimal posture, you can also really affect their physiology, their emotions. Um, And I think, you know, it's a, it's a growing field in structural integration and body work and spatial medicine. And that's definitely where I'm heading and something that is one of my biggest passions. Um, And it's something that I'm definitely looking to, to grow and kind of demystify. Cause like I said before, it is, a lot of these natural health modalities seem to be very, um, not unreachable, but I guess airy fairy sort of where it's like people don't really know what they are, um, but they can, they have the potential to help so many people. So yes. yeah, structural yeah, even integration. Even like the body word work. rolfing, right? It's like, well, what, you know, even that word, somebody would be like, well, that sounds a little like out there. Sound and like you're puking. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> yes. So I, oh yes, that's amazing. The, the four agreements. I mean, imagine if that was taught in school, imagine if they took out some silly something or other, right. That none of us ever need or use and mm-hmm. schools all over the world actually taught that those, that very simple principle of those four agreements and what that would do to society, the kind of children that grow up and become whatever they become uh, yeah, I love that book too. And it, it carries into so many things. It carries into personal relationships, business relationships, client relationships. I mean, the way you just relate in the world in general, um, it's so beneficial. Totally agree. Yep. Yeah. And it's such a quick, easy read too. You know, you can finish it in like an hour and your life will be changed. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it's true. Um, okay. All right. So I'm curious if you had one piece of, you know, specific advice it doesn't have to be around writing a book, but kind of one general piece of advice for coaches, you know, newer coaches listening, or even people that maybe aren't coaches yet and are thinking about doing it, but don't understand kind of what it takes or where they should start. What's a piece of advice that you'd like to share with our listeners? Yeah. Another good question. Um, so if I could go back in time to when I was first starting my journey in the health world and tell myself something, I think it would be, you know, I spend, I spent so much time taking in information. Like I said, I'm a big nerd with all this. I could read all the books, do all the online courses, but where I truly began learning is when I really took the time to apply all the information I was learning. And I know it sounds kind of obvious, but we kind of grow up in this world, especially the way the education system is where we're just consistently learning, being tested on it, learning, being tested on it. And, you know, it just leaves your brain if you're not applying it. So, um, you know, what I wish I would have done early on, even earlier on in my college career is, you know, spend a lot of time in, uh, physical therapy clinics, do all the personal training. And I, you know, I did that at an earlier age than I guess most, most practitioners would, but if I had really started applying early on, I think it would have, it would have really helped me down the line. Yes. And then another, another great quote that I love regarding this whole topic, um, Dr. Paul Lamb, who's a Tai Chi teacher from Australia. Mm -hmm. He, um, in one of his books, he says, you don't have to be a doctor to provide hope. And I thought that was a really, really great quote. Cause you know, whether you're a health coach, a personal trainer, um, 
whatever, like most people in their health or healing journey really just need a little dose of hope and empowerment and it can make an absolute world of a difference for them. Yes. Oh, I love that quote. I've never heard that before. And I think it speaks to, to our, again, our society and our culture, right? Where we've kind of glorified and put on a pedestal, the people that have been in school the longest and the people that have spent the most money on their education, they're the experts. There's no way they're, they're not. And the people that have done the most, you know, rigorous, expensive work, well, those are the ones that can help you. And you're right. It just takes a little bit of hope and anybody that cares can give mm-hmm. you hope. Anybody that has a little bit of knowledge with a whole lot of heart can give you hope. Cause I don't know about you, but I know a lot of really smart people that don't care much about others or don't care much about, you know, how much their, what they inflict on others as far as, well, am I leaving them better than I came? They're wonderful people, but that's not necessarily their main focus where I think someone who gets into the field that we're in something that probably ties a good majority of us all together is our desire to just help and make people feel good and leave them better than we found them. And yeah, that's such, such a great quote. And so to go back to your original point, the original um, answer that you gave about kind of just getting started, do you feel like you got more comfortable with the information that you learned. So you were learning a lot, you know, with the books, did you get more comfortable applying that information or did you actually start to learn more once you were kind of in the trenches and working with clients? I definitely think a little bit of both. Um, but it's true to where, you know, you can, you can learn from the books all day, but inevitably what you see in the real world is going to be very different. And then that forces you to be more adaptable to, learn about different things than you thought you should know about. Um, And that just makes you a better practitioner in the end and able to help more people. Yes. And it gives you the confidence that, you know, I can do this. Okay. So that I helped the person that had, you know, A, B and C going on. And that was something that actually felt challenging. And so giving yourself a little bit of the confidence by just starting and getting your feet wet. And I've said this, I think in other episodes, um, and I say this with you know new health coaches that work for Equal Life or other coaches that you know ask me for mentorship. You'll typically know way more than the person you're trying to help. Do you know mm-hmm. everything? Are you the you know complete expert on every single topic? No. But to your point, you can still provide hope enough information that the client is likely going to see some improvements in where their the direction of their life is going or in some of their symptoms. It doesn't take much to kind of help somebody just change a little bit of their direction. And then that direction can change a little bit more over time. And it really doesn't take much. Yep. And it's so easy nowadays to get caught in that, um, that idea of seeing, you know, you you see on social media all the time, all these amazing practitioners Mm -hmm. like Dr. Cabral, like Paul check, like Dr. Mark Hyman, all these guys who have so much experience and you're like, wow, like I have so much to learn before I can start helping people. But in reality, like you said, you know, more than 99% of people out there and all it takes is a little hope sometimes. Yes. And sometimes the social media world, it's amazing, right? From an education standpoint, we get to learn from all of the, you know, those three amazing men that you just mentioned, but it also gives you something to compare yourself to. And we have Mm -hmm. to remember that the Dr. Cabral's started, I mean, I think I've you know mentioned it on some IHP lives and some other podcasts. I knew Dr. Cabral when he first started studying this stuff and I saw how hard he worked. Like mm-hmm. he didn't, like you don't just end up there, right? His, his passion and his, his hard work was, again, something that's so motivating. And I like always keep in the back of my mind, the fact that he's grown our equal life company to what it has. And he's reaching so many practitioners Mm -hmm. is honestly are inspiring sometimes to me. Um, and so we see where they've gotten to, but we don't, we don't always see how they, how they got started or where it began. And I think it's important for us to all remember that we're kind of right where we need to be. And this is the starting point to, you know, reaching a, a whatever point we want to, we all have to start somewhere. Totally. And that's another great point that you mentioned of, of, you know, spending time around other people who have that same purpose driven mindset, 
like the Dr. Cabral's and just being around different, you know, other IHPs or other health coaches, or for me, you know, other body workers that I'm learning from, it just makes me so much more driven to be around all these people who have a similar mindset. Cause you know, there are a lot of people out there who have a very doom and gloom mindset to the world. And, you know, we want to be able to help those people, but for your personal growth, I mean, if you can spend time around others who have that same drive and ambition, I mean, it can further you so much. Absolutely. Yep. I couldn't agree more. Okay. So as far as where people can kind of find you on places like social media, your website, tell us a little bit about where you can be found in the whole health coaching space. Yeah. Yep. So uh, my website is yourhealthblueprint.net and you can find me on Instagram at my name. So Nick Kundrat underscore that's N I C K K U N D R A T underscore. Um, and I am on Facebook, um, but I don't use it a whole lot. So Instagram and my website are going to be my two big ones. Okay, perfect. And then tell us the name of your book again, just so that positively type one, positively type one. And when did you publish that? When was I published that May of 2020. So it's been, it's been about a year now. Perfect. Yeah. Great. Nick, it was so great having you on the Integrative Health Coaching Success Podcast. Thank you for sharing all your author wisdom and everything that you've learned since uh, such a young age. I think it's going to be such a, a valuable listen for everyone. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This has been great. All right. Thanks, Nick. Thank you so Talk much. Talk to you soon. Take care.